Good afternoon. I'm Derek Winkle, the Executive Director of Manufacturing Operations for Renewable Energy Group, and I'm also currently serving as the Treasurer of the Iowa Renewable Fuels Association. You'll have to forgive me if I'm getting a little giddy up here. I'm actually kind of geeking out. So I only watch documentaries, reality TV shows. I'm kind of a Discovery Channel addict. So when I heard there was going to be a film, a documentary, about the industry that I've been in for 12 years and am passionate about, I was very excited. So I'm beyond thrilled to be able to be here today and speak with the producer of that film. And that film is Hot Grease, uh, the Discovery Channel documentary that we just got a little taste of there in the intro clip. So I'm joined by Paul Lovelace. Welcome, Paul. Paul is the uh, co-director, producer, and editor, so wore a lot of hats on the film, and uh, really made a great film that covered many aspects of the biodiesel industry, uh, production, supply chain, but especially focused on the substantial environmental benefits and the numerous policy and uh, market challenges that we're facing. So as I mentioned, it was on Discovery Channel, and so it premiered uh, last November. And just really looking forward to talking with Paul today. So uh, Paul, you joined us all the way from New York City, so we appreciate you making the trip. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your background? Sure, and, and thanks, Derek. And I want to thank the IRFA and uh, Cassidy, Lucy, Grant, Monty, and for bringing me out. It's really been uh, been a great experience, and I've had some wonderful conversations, and I've learned a lot um, today. So it's it's great to be here. And I'm a I'm a documentary filmmaker uh, originally from Missouri, and I um, you know went to film school and college, and stayed in New York, and I've worked on a wide variety of subjects and. Um, uh, you know, I work as an editor and a director and a producer, which is a role that I, I took on with this particular film, and uh, along with my collaborators, Jessica Wolfson and Sam Douglas. Great. So today we want to talk about Paul's experiences in making the film, what he learned about biodiesel along the way, and uh, how he hopes this film really helps share the amazing story of American biodiesel. So we're going to jump right into some questions. So how did you become interested in making a documentary about biodiesel? Well, it's really interesting how this started because it, it, the, the genesis of the project began with this idea of recycled cooking oil and, um, and how it had turned into a commodity and grease theft. Um, the end result, you know, several years later, it airs on Discovery Channel and it's a very, very different film. Um, it, um, you know, early, early on, ourselves and Discovery Channel wanted to kind of broaden it beyond just this kind of narrow scope. And, um, and so we really became fascinated with the biodiesel industry and specifically the, the public policy part of the industry, which, um, which drives the narrative. And, um, but it started with just like this, you know, very small piece of the puzzle for the industry and, um, you know, kind of took off from there. Sure. Uh, so the title is Hot Grease, and you mentioned the grease theft a little bit, which is kind of, was a very interesting aspect, I, I guess, from the viewer's perspective to see, you know, thieves out there behind restaurants and of, of something that used to be a waste product they had to pay to get rid of. Why, why was it still, in, and there were a lot of other things that you went into, but why was it still important to cover that grease aspect of it? Well, that's how it started, and that's how we got the funding for it. And um, and it's funny, like the you know the final film, the grease theft. I think it's like two minutes of the of the yeah. film, which is you know the title might not be as uh, appropriate, but the, but anyway, the um, uh, we you know we're we were fascinated by that, the idea of just turning this waste, something that a lot of people don't even consider when they're you know eating French fries or whatever it might be, um, or sitting at a restaurant that. Um, you know, that there's real value to it, both economic and environmental value to it. Yeah, indeed. So uh, the producers, because you were, the, the film was primarily set in the Houston area, and so most of the uh, producers that you featured 
we're using used cooking oil as a feedstock. Uh, here in the Midwest and other parts of the country, we use, uh, besides using a fair amount of used cooking oil, we use other uh, byproducts of food production as well. So that could be distiller's corn oil, animal fats, of course, uh, soybean oil. So how did you also cover those other uh, feedstocks and, and what did you learn about the feedstocks besides used cooking oil? Sure, and, and that was one of our real concerns is because we wanted to make it, if you watch, the, if you're able to see the film or if you've seen it, we, 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 you know, we make it very, very clear in the beginning that, um, uh, that soybean oil is the dominant feedstock. We wouldn't want a viewer to walk away thinking, you know, it's an industry, you know, that, that you know, thrives on uh, or, or, or works only with recycled cooking oil. Um, and we, and also like the, a very, you know, a lot of the people that we would show it to as we're getting feedback along the way, you know, because we're dealing with things that can get a little complicated, spe specifically with like talking about the RFS. And um, so we really tried to um, get feedback from people that know nothing about, and, and we knew very little about the industry coming, coming into it. Um, so, and a lot of people we found, you know, confuse ethanol with biodiesel. So the other thing we try to do very early on is, you know, point out that, you know, they are two different, you know, two different things. And, um, and so, you know, we really had to make this for an audience um, who might come into it as complete novices. And, um, but as far as, um, you know, I, I think that you could do, you know, the film, the backdrop of the film is Houston, Texas. And hence, that's how it started. And we did like the idea of having it be in the energy capital of the world with this, you know, emerging, um, you know, this growing renewable energy uh, source. And so, um, but I think that you could make, and we would like to do this, I think you could make another completely different film and just focus on, um, you know, focus on uh, states with a lot of farming and, um, and or, or rural America. and. Um, and we've been, you know, we gained, we definitely gained insight. And one of our characters in the film uh, has several refineries, and he does use um, a variety of feedstocks. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, and uh, and soybeans are certainly a big part of what uh, of his operation. So yeah, yeah. There was a lot of the parts of the the challenges and and things that we'll we'll get into now. But but there was a fair amount of education too, like you said. So. Um, definitely recommend it for for anybody to see and and you may if you're in this room you you have a base knowledge probably anyway but you might have friends or relatives it'd be just a good educational piece for them to see as as, as well as entertaining so one of the other pieces that you focused on were the uh, environmental benefits what uh, drew you to pursue that angle well I mean, it's certainly something that I I, I care about and um, in the you know in, in the bigger scheme of things, but um, but I think that it, that's an area where we definitely learned a lot you know over the over the course of the film and how the various feedstocks like really uh, they do reduce carbon emissions and um, and that was kind of the entry point of getting into the film and this particular strand of Discovery Channel documentaries like that's a focus of that um, you know so you do have to um, that you know that has to be a big part of the narrative but um, but I think. You know, again, like we got really that, and I would say the economic benefits. Those are the two things mm -hmm. that, um, for me personally, um, really drew me into the subject matter, and uh, and you know made me a, a really strong believer in the industry. Right. So uh, maybe it was kind of a, a plot twist, but at, at the end, the film was just covering how the industry was facing a big and sudden challenge of the EPA proposing to actually reduce the RFS volumes at a time when we were really recommending they should be uh, increased, so you're able to pick up that aspect, uh, but yet there wasn't quite a resolution to that yet at the end, so I think we have a clip that uh, kind of shows how that was presented. ask you to keep this question in mind. Are we doing everything we can under the law as Congress intended to ensure that we're using as much biodiesel, renewable diesel, and other advanced biofuels as we can? We've received a proposal from the EPA. It has not become law yet, 
what the EPA has proposed to substantially ratchet down biodiesel requirements under the renewable fuel standard. There has never been a more overt attack on the fundamental principles of the renewable fuel standard. Congress provided EPA with waiver authority and we encourage the EPA to use this authority to further reduce the 2018 volumes. When the law was written, Congress provided the EPA the authority under extremely limited conditions to reduce the requirements in the law for a very fixed period of time just to provide some relief in the event of a drought or some kind of supply disruption. Congress never intended for this waiver authority to be used this way. And it's clear that the justification has nothing to do with anything other than reducing the oil company's responsibilities to blend in biofuels. EPA's proposal to reduce the RFS volumes is appropriate, but does not go far enough. We seem to have returned to a situation where uh, we're not looking forward, but we're looking backwards. A lot of the uh, environmental deregulation that uh, President Trump has undertaken is definitely going in the right direction. President Trump has done more to deregulate the economy than any previous president, on the environmental side at least. Our detractors are after us like never before. This all gives me a strong suspicion that big oil companies and big oil refineries are prevailing once again in this Trump EPA. Ultimately, we know that uh, they backed off of the, the proposal to reduce the volumes. What, what was your reaction to seeing uh, President Trump actually intervene in that issue? Well, I mean, I wasn't surprised because we, you know, we did a lot of research and, um, you know, and various candidates, because we, we were filming as the, uh, you know, as the election was happening. So uh, trying to learn the, where the different can, um, candidates on both, you know, on both sides stood on the issue. And, um, you know, and he never, um, you know, he, he, we never found him to say anything negative uh, about the RFS. In fact, we use a clip in the film from an earlier scene where he's standing probably right there um, uh, supporting the RFS. So. Uh, that um, that didn't surprise us. Um, I mean, you know, like anyone, it was sort of felt very unpredictable at that at that moment. But um, uh, but you know, he had never you know he'd been very he seemed like he was committed to it. Sure. So the industry faces a number of other uh, policy and market challenges besides just uh, the things in the RFS. So we have another clip that will kind of. Uh, highlight that if we play the next clip. Who opposes harmful fuel mandates? Food producers and restaurants. You wake up in the mornings here in Washington, D.C. and watch television, very likely you'll see an American petroleum industry advertisement talking about how awful the renewable fuels industry is. Now, it doesn't say we're big oil. Energy, environment. Some say it's either or. I, I don't, don't buy it. it. And you won't recognize you know, the group they put together to do it. I'm Rebecca. I'm Andy. Join us and become an energy voter. Every major industry becomes a major industry on the power of its ability to lobby. That is essential to, to any business and certainly to oil and gas. The American Petroleum Institute has the collective power of the oil industry behind it. It's a massive organization with huge clout. I mean, it, it represents 700 oil and gas companies. It, its whole point is to make sure that the world is set up in a way that oil and gas companies can best benefit. I mean, that means that it spends a lot of money on lobbying in D.C. and in all the states. Those guys have uh, more resources. I mean, you're, you're essentially talking about the largest, most wealthy corporations in the entire world. They're looking at lobbying budgets that are in the tens of millions of dollars. They're looking at advertising budgets uh, that are the same. And where are the small dog in a big fight? It's been a daunting task to get the renewable fuel standard enacted and now to continue to say, let's continue building on that growth. 
Every year, the Environmental Protection Agency, they set a level of biodiesel that should be required to be blended into our fuel supply stream. Our organization has looked at raw material available, has looked at existing capacity, and where the Environmental Protection Agency came out with 2.1 billion gallons of biodiesel. We are suggesting that that number could be as high as 2.5 billion gallons. 2.5 billion gallons for the United States would essentially mean parking all the cars in Colorado, Connecticut, and Louisiana for one year. That segment really exposes how the petroleum industry uses its vast resources in these uh, front groups to advertise and, and lobby you know, against renewable fuels. Why was it uh, important to showcase that in the film? Well, I think um, it was important to us to showcase that, uh, you know, how, um, you know, how, how long they've been able to, um, they've gotten strong support on, um, and they've been able to grow. And, um, you know, and we would always hear this argument, um, particularly in regards to the RFS, like, let's get rid of it, let's get a level playing field. So we, it was important to us to show that, well, look, I mean, they've, you know, any, you know, any energy, uh, public policy can help it grow. And, um, and so I think that, um, but I think in regards to um, the petroleum industry, it's, you know, it, it, and we use that, the term several times in the film, David versus Goliath, and, um, and it really is. Like, I mean, that's also kind of what, what we highlighted and what really, uh, you know, just how the biodiesel industry really does punch above its weight. Um, considering the vast resources from, you know, API and just, um, and, and, and others. I mean, it's, um, so, and, and what they've been able to get done, but also at the same time, like how daunting it can be and just how much work is involved. Um, you know, we, we wanted to show that and. Uh, yeah, I think you covered in there too some of the, just the tax advantages and some of those preferential tax treatment items have, have been in place for a, a hundred years, I think. Yeah, which I, I didn't, you know, I, I didn't know. I'd never, honestly, I'd never really uh, learned or thought about that before. And, um, and yeah, we just felt like, and, and we're, you know, we're not like naive or, you know, in the, like we don't, we're, we're not even pretending for a second that, you know, the petroleum industry is going anywhere. In fact, like we point out, like they're collaborators in some ways, you know, because of, sure. of the blend. So it's, um, you know, we try and add some nuance in there. But um, even though that's, you know, like the two people in the ad sort of, yeah. you know, we couldn't resist <laughs> including that. So we kind of went into it knowing a little, having one angle, learned a lot, and it was very complex. How did making the film change your views personally of, of renewable fuels? A lot. I mean, it, it um, and in a, in really substantial ways that, that continues, you know, it, it happened today. Like you, you know, I get into, you get in these conversations about um, uh, specifically like the, um, the economic benefits for rural America and, um, you know, and certainly the environmental part, but, um, uh, but I went into it not knowing not knowing a lot, not, you know, not knowing very much, and then um, certainly not being, you know, being open to the renewable fuels, but um, came out learning a lot more, still learning, and I just think it's, um, it's been one of the great professional experiences of my life, like doing something like this, where you come into it in a very narrow, you know, uh, a narrow part, narrow scope, and uh, come out learning, gaining a lot more, and continuing to, to, you know, yeah. to meet people. And what do you want the uh, average viewer of the film, what do you want their main takeaways to be? Just to understand that you, you know, we have this, this, you know, this, um, this energy source that's here, that it's, 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 it's being produced here and it grows jobs here. It's better for the environment and how we really need to encourage its growth. Um, whether it's public, you know, on a federal level, on a local level, um, the city you live in, the community you live in, and uh, it's really important to us. And that, and uh, well, one great thing is we had a it premiered at a, a film festival in New York, and um, lots of people came up afterwards, just knew nothing about this before they came into it, 
and really open their eyes. And there's not, you know, that's the best compliment we could have heard because um, you never know what the what the reaction's going to be. You never know the risk, what the reception's going to be. And it's been overwhelmingly positive and uh, supportive of what they, you know, of yeah. spending time with the characters and learning about the industry. Yeah, that's great. Uh, so I just have a few more questions, but we'd like to get some questions from the audience as well. So if you have a question, if you could start making your way to the microphones in the aisles and kind of get uh, lined up there, uh, and then we'll get to any audience questions that we have. So um, kind of heard you there that, that there's plenty of more facets of the industry to cover and just wondering what your future plans are and if we can expect a sequel. Uh, I think it would be a very different film, and I think we would like to do another another film, and um, I, we'd, and we'd want to focus more. Um, you know, we wouldn't go in. It, it would focus more on the soy, you know, soybean oil and um, and producers and different parts of the industry, and also continuing to fo follow what's happening on the, um, you know, in, in Washington and how that's affecting the industry. And um, but we're. You know, we're trying to make that happen. It all comes down to funding, um, but I think there's a lot of stories to tell out there, and I think that you could, um, you know, we we, def we would love to keep going and um, kind of build upon what we've done with this film, and um, yeah, and hopefully, hopefully, hopefully it'll yeah, happen. Sure. Well, you heard it here. If you're looking to finance an awesome documentary, make sure you see Paul after this session. So. Yeah, please, please come say hello. <laughs> Um, so we've, we've had some clips here, uh, which is a little teaser, so I'm sure many folks that are here that, that haven't seen it yet are going to be interested in seeing the film. How can they get it? How do they view it? It's, um, it's on iTunes, so you can buy it for $2.99, which is a, a deal if I've ever heard, heard of one. And, um, it's, and then Discovery Channel, it's on, if you have cable, it's on demand. And, um, and so those are two two places that you can see it. And we're continuing. We're trying to do more screenings with it as well. It's gonna. We're gonna show it in uh, D.C. in March. And you know, we'd love to do screenings um, is any place we can. So if anyone out there uh, has any ideas or, um, on, on you know on that front, please please reach out to us. We're easy to find. Lost footage films. Or you could just search for my name. So great. All right, I'm guessing I stole your question over there, sir, on where to get it. Yep, okay, we have a question. Yes, oh, there's a microphone in the middle. Yeah, I didn't even see middle. that one, great. Yes, go ahead. All right, uh, Jerry Meyer from Mill Grove. What is Big Oil's reaction to this film? Uh, we haven't heard anything. I mean, we, um, I mean, they probably don't like it very much, but, uh, um, but they, haven't, they haven't said anything publicly, and um, so. Yeah, I don't know. Okay, any other questions from the audience? Uh, if you do have a question, again, just step up to one of the mics and I guess wave at me if you're at the middle mic. Um, so if, if no more questions from the audience, I might have a few more uh, I could ask. So what do you think we as producers in the Midwest could do to better share our story with consumers in urban areas? Um, well, I think that there's, I mean, that's a hard, it's a hard one to answer because, but I, I do, I do think that it's not so much just sharing it with, um, you know, trying to get a, a, you know, a documentary made or trying to get an article or in a magazine or a national uh, a newspaper, like a national newspaper, a publication. Um, I think on a local level, I think that's equally powerful. Um, you know, it, there's a lot of great stories to tell out there, and I know because I've, I've met a lot of people. Um, you know, today and and uh, last week, um, and um, and uh, you know, just throughout the process of making the film, and um, I think it's a lot of stories to. T I think it's just getting the story out there, whether it be in a local paper, whether it be online. And it's just kind of building the word of mouth. Um, if it was up to me, I would um, have multiple documentaries and articles in every magazine and newspaper. Sure. But, I, but I, I just think it's just, just knowing that there's a good story to tell and, um, and trying to tell that story. Yeah, just keeping, keeping the story out there. Great, question over here. Yes, uh, I'm Craig Lang in Brooklyn, Iowa. And for the last three years, I've worked with a company that's kind of a secret uh, that uh, 
maybe you would be interested in on the next thing is a company that makes uh, cleaning and lubricant products uh, from soy oil and also utilizes corn. Uh, it also uh, uses a lot of the co-products from the biodiesel industry, the methyl esters that are produced. And so that's the next level of thing that competes with a petroleum-based industry that has higher value. Thank you. Well, that's great. Thank you. And, and we, um, we touch on that a little bit in the film, but we'd like to do more because I, I think that's a really exciting, um, you know, finding new ways to incorporate um, biofuels into our day-to-day -day lives. I think that's a very, you know, that's a, there's a lot of exciting uh, storylines there. Thank you. Great. And with that, for, we're out of time, so I want to uh, thank you, Paul, for making the trip out, for sharing the clips with us, and just for making such a great film with a great look at the industry and the challenges we face. So with that, if you could join me in thanking Paul. Thanks, Derek. Thank you. Thank you.